Welcome to week three. In this series of lectures, we're going to be looking at the church, its uh, identity, and its mission. And today, I want to uh, talk to you about the church's identity, what that means for who we are as Christians and our purpose. Um, I think because in order to know what we need to do, we first need to know what we are. Uh, think about it in the same way as like you're going to uh, the car lot to buy a new car. Um, why are you going? Why are you buying your car? It's probably because you have a particular purpose, and there's a there's a particular reason why you're needing to buy that car. So, uh, let's say that right now you might drive a single cab pickup truck, but you're about to have twins, and you have a wife or a husband, whatever your situation is, and and uh, you can't haul everything in that single cab pickup truck, so you've got to go look for a minivan. Well, in order to understand that you need a minivan or an SUV or something like that, you have to understand what those things are. And we what separates a minivan from an SUV and what separates an SUV from a pickup truck and all those things. So once we sort those out, we can figure out what that particular thing is going to do to help us as we try to use it for our advantage. So that's what I want us to talk about today with the church. Now, the word church in Greek is the word ekklesia. E-K-K-L-E-S-S-I-A. Okay? Ecclesia. Uh, that word is, in some sense, a compound word. The word ek, E-K, is the word meaning out of. And the word, uh, the last part, klesia, uh, is from a, a derivative from the Greek word kaleo, which means to, I call. And so... Many people have looked at this word and they said, oh, ecclesia means the called out, or the ones who are called out. And linguistically, that is true. However, that word uh, does not necessarily mean that in a theological sense. I'll give you an example in English. The word butterfly is a compound word. You have the word butter and you have the word fly. But when you look at a butterfly, you don't see a stick of butter and you don't see an annoying insect, right? Uh, a butterfly is neither a butter nor a fly, but it is a butterfly. So we have to be very careful with our words and how we use compound uh, words in, in determining meaning. The ecclesia, the word ecclesia, was used in the ancient Greek culture to talk about an assembly or a gathering of people, okay? So if you are going to the Senate, if you're going to vote for something, uh, if you're having a family get together, it's the ecclesia. And so, what is the ecclesia in the New Testament? Well, it's simply that it is a gathering of people. It's a gathering of Christians for the purpose of being together. It has nothing to do theologically with being called out from the world and being uh, brought from this to to Jesus or whatever. Although that is true, the word does not necessarily dictate that meaning. Okay. So, uh, ecclesia just means the assembly. All right, so on your uh, exam, I'm probably going to ask, what does the word ecclesia mean? And the assembly will be the correct answer. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, when he's talking to Peter and to the rest of his apostles, he says, on this rock, I will build my church. This is Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And his disciples say, well, some say you're John the Baptist, others say you're Elijah or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds by saying, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We call that the good confession. Okay? And Jesus says, you're absolutely right. And then Jesus says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. If you're reading this in Greek, it would say, you are rock, and on, these, or on this rock I will build my church. This has led many people in, in uh, other denominations, particularly the Catholic tradition, to suggest that Peter was the first pope. You, I don't think that you get that from this text because uh, a, couple of, a couple of reasons. First of all, 
the proper name that we have is Peter. Peter is actually a nickname. Uh, it comes from the Greek word Petros. If you know what the word petrified means, it means to become stone-like. And, and so a petrified forest is wood that's become like stone. When you say, I was petrified, like I was scared and I was petrified, it means that you froze up and couldn't do anything, like stone. Okay. Uh, so the word Peter, or Petros in Greek, means stone or rock. And then Jesus says, and on this rock, I will build my church. But that is not the same word as Petros. It is the word Petra. And you say, well, Joshua, what's the difference? Petros is masculine. Petra is feminine. The word Petra is used of a gravel bed, like a, a foundation, a, a, a driveway of types, like a gravel bed. And then Petros is like a singular boulder. Many people have many different interpretations of this, but this is the one I found most helpful, and maybe you will too. I think what Jesus is saying there is he's telling Peter that you are the boulder. You are the leader. You are the main guy. And when we get to the book of Acts, that is exactly what happens in Acts chapter 2. Peter is the one who takes his stand. Peter is the one who... Uh, preaches that sermon on the day of Pentecost. Peter is the one who inaugurates the kingdom uh, as a reality. And so I think you have that prophetically spoken in that, I mean, excuse me, in uh, Matthew chapter 16, that you are the boulder. You are the, the main guy. But then I, I, I think Jesus looks aside at all of his other apostles and says, and on this, pointing to them, and on this rock bed, I will build my church. It's not on Peter that the church will be built, but it's on the the bed, the foundation of the apostles and their teachings and their workings in the early church, which is what you get in the book of Acts and the letters. And so I, I think that, that they're the foundation for the church, as taught by Jesus, is the teaching of the apostles. However, Jesus doesn't stop there by saying, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build the church. He says, on this rock I will build my church. That's a pretty important two-letter word. It's Jesus' church, my church. I think there's something to be said here for what we call ourselves as Christians. Um uh, we need to have an identity that says we belong to Jesus. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't think that the sign on your church building is going to dictate your Christ-likeness. I've seen a lot of people who go to uh, congregations where the congregation is teaching everything they're supposed to be teaching, but that person is not living the way he's supposed to be living. Then I've seen others who have gone to congregations of false teaching, unfortunately, who actually get in and study their Bible and realize that it's false teaching and try to their best to, to follow the teachings of, of the Word. But we need to realize that this is Jesus' church. It's His church. It's not our church. okay? Um, and, and I do think, I don't want to be so dogmatic with this, but I do think that we need to stop saying things like, well, at my church we do this. It ain't your church. It's his church. It might be your congregation, but it's Jesus' church. So Jesus is the head of the church. He is the head of the body. He is king over the kingdom. Everything about the church belongs to him. And we, we really need to realize that. Okay? Uh, as, as history plays out and Jesus dies and is buried and then ultimately is resurrected, uh, 50 days after Pentecost or after the Passover comes Pentecost. And that's where we read in Acts chapter 2, uh, where there are thousands, if not millions, of Jews in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. Peter, among the others, uh, are filled with the Spirit. At, in the beginning of Acts, at the end of Acts chapter 1, the beginning of Acts chapter 2, they take their stand and they start preaching the gospel. 
and people are willing to listen. You know, so we we have people listening to the gospel. We have people obeying the gospel. Peter tells them how to obey the gospel in Acts chapter two and verse thirty-eight. They ask, "What are we supposed to do?" You know, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. Now we move further down to Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. This is such an interesting passage because it talks about how 3,000 people, which is a very small minority. I mean, I know for us 3,000 is quite a lot, but uh, at this time and place in Jerusalem, there are probably millions of people, and so 3,000 is a very small minority. But he says that they were added to the church, that God added them. I, I want to pull this up. I'm going to have to look it up here on my computer real quick because I don't want to misquote it. And so it says, those who, were accept, th- those who accepted his message were baptized. Okay, there's what Peter said to do in verse 38. And that day, about 3,000 people were added. Now, this word added, like that, that's pretty important. It's, it's not that we gain admission. It's not that we pay our dues. It's not that we do anything. God is the one who adds us to his body. Who, he adds us to his kingdom. He adds us to his fold. We don't gain citizenship by taking a citizenship test like you do here in America if you want to become a citizen. We are added added based on our obedient response to obeying the gospel. And that's that's very important. So how do you get in the church? Well, you get in the church by being added to the church. How are you added to the church? You're added to the church by being baptized into Christ. It's what it says here in verse 41. It's what it says in verse 38. It's what uh, Peter says in uh, Acts chapter, or excuse me, in First Peter chapter three and verse twenty-one, I believe is the passage. Uh, Paul has a lot to say about it in Romans chapter six, Colossians chapter two. Uh, a, a lot to say here about how we get in Christ, and it's the same message every time. And so that's how you're added to the church. Um, notice here that baptism is a reenactment of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We get that from Romans chapter six. It is not an expression of faith. It is the process by which sin is removed. And we learn that from Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. That's what Ananias tells Paul. Uh, Why do you wait, rise, and uh, be baptized, washing away your sins? So it's his church. The church is the assembly of people. We are added to the church. Additionally, We've already kind of made mention of this already, but the church is the body of Christ. A couple of passages that will help us with this. The first is 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27. And again, I'm going to look this up so I'm not misquoting it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27. Paul says to the church at Corinth, You are Christ's body, and each of you is a member of it. Okay? You are Christ's body, Each of you is a member of it. So we're all part of the one body of Christ. And Paul will say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he'll say this also in Romans chapter 12, that uh, as we are part of this body, we all have different functions. And so you and I have gifts that can be used for the body of Christ. Uh, Every part of the body is important. And if you don't believe that, just ask someone who doesn't have use of a particular part of their body. And I don't mean this to sound insensitive. Uh, I certainly believe that if you don't have use of a certain part of your body, that you can live a well and and fulfilled life. And and I've seen many people do that. But, you know, it's interesting that uh, I have a friend named Noah. Noah is a fellow auctioneer. And Noah was a soldier and had his arm and leg blown off. I think it's his his right arm and his right leg blown off uh, when he was in the military. Um, He will tell you that no prosthetic comes remotely close to doing the same capabilities as an actual leg or an actual arm. Now, he lives a well and fulfilled life. 
Uh, he's actually very influential and uh, has a huge following and has been on the cover of Men's Health for crying out loud. You know, he's he's got it pretty good. But still, his he has limitations based on those things. So being part of the body, you have a particular function. And that function is necessary for the body of Christ. And so, G, or excuse me, Paul says that we are part of the body of Christ. Now, you are Christ's body, and each of you is a member of it. One more is uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. Let me find this real quick. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. Now, we have to start back in verse 11, but Paul says to the church at Ephesus, And he himself gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That is, to build up the body of Christ. So why do we have people like apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers? Now, why do we have that in the early church and then some of those still exist today? Well, Paul says in verse 12, it's for the purpose of equipping the saints. Okay, who are the saints? And Paul says that is the body of Christ. So the saints are the holy ones. The holy ones are the body of Christ. There, there's no, in the, in the New Testament, there is no gaining sainthood after you die. Okay? You are a saint when you become a Christian. So if you're a Christian, if you've been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you're living for Him, you are a saint. So I, I wanted to bring those two passages up. There are others. Um, Colossians chapter 1, 18, I think, is another one where the kingdom is called the body of Christ, uh, that, that this collection, this assembly of people, that we're all part of the body of Christ together. And one final thing that I'll just mention briefly, and then we'll uh, stop this video and have another one here for the mission of the church in just a moment. But the, the church in the book of Revelation is often called the bride of Christ, and Jesus has a lot to say about that in parables in the Gospels about the bride of Christ, about how the bridegroom being Jesus, is going away for a time and is going to come back to receive the bride to himself. Well, who is the bride? The bride is the kingdom. The bride is the church. The bride is the body of Christ. These are all terms used to talk about the relationship between Christ and his people, between the king and the citizens, the body and the members, the bridegroom and the bride. And I love that picture because in the Old Testament, God and Israel are often depicted in husband-wife relationship. And unfortunately, Israel is often playing the harlot. She's going off and cheating on God, cheating on her husband with others. And if we're not careful, the church can be very guilty of that too. Uh, but the bridegroom is coming back for his bride. And either you're part of that body or you're not. So this is the thing about denominations. Like, the word, denomin the, the word denominate means to divide. And the body of Christ cannot be divided. And so if you think that you're part of a denomination, you, that's real dangerous there. And I'm not trying to sound insensitive here. I'm just trying to teach. It, it, it really is dangerous because denominate means to divide. The body of Christ can't be divided. And when you look in Scripture, how many churches are there? Well, if we ask how many congregations are there, that's a whole other topic. I'm asking how many churches are there. And the church is the body of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. So how many brides of Christ are there? There's one. How many bodies of Christ are there? There's one. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Right? So in the, in the book of Revelation, the bridegroom is coming back for his bride. And then we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb, a great celebration where bride and bridegroom are joined together. That's the identity of the church. The church's identity has to be wrapped up in Jesus. okay? Because he is the one who bought the church with his blood. right? So with that, guys, I'll leave you and see you in the next video when we talk about the mission of the church. Again, if you have any questions, uh, please contact me. You know, send me an email, and we'll be happy to talk about that, okay? Uh, we'll see you in the next video.